I know you've got an ear out for the start of the podcast, but before we jump into today's episode, I wanted to remind you to keep an eye out for Daryl Lee's limited edition Christmas treats, because they're in stores now. Like the iconic Christmas nougat pudding, so yummy and a a gorgeous little gift. And some delicious Chrissy-themed twists on your favourite treats, like the Daryl Lee Rockley Road with chewy red and green jelly pieces, green and red crunchy milk chocolate balls, my favourites, and green apple and strawberry flavoured licorice. Watch them disappear. Your Christmas treats table will pop with colour and scrumptiousness. Spread some joy, bring the fun, and enjoy the Christmas tradition that is Daryl Lee. Hurry before they sell out. Daryl Lee makes Christmas better. This is The Five of My Life with me, Nigel Marsh. The series where I talk to notable people about five of their defining things. The way it works is my guests always choose a favourite film, book, song, place and possession. They tell me their choices in advance so I can research them, but they don't tell me why they've chosen them. That's the subject of our conversation. The reason I devised this series is I wanted to create a slightly different way to gain an insight into the real lives and thoughts of prominent people. Tara M. Brumfit is an author, director, photographer and producer. She's also an activist who founded and runs the Body Image Movement, an organisation passionately committed to shifting the way the world thinks about themselves and their bodies. Through her film, books and media appearances, Tara's powerful message has reached over 100 million people worldwide. Her life-changing work has been lauded by both the UN and the Gina Davis Institute. So, Taryn, tell me, what has been your favourite Five of My Life story so far? Uh, Definitely Steve Willis. I loved listening to him um, and learning more about the book, which is on my next book list to get. Um, What was the name of it again? Oh, yeah, Resilience. Yeah, Yeah. amazing. Yeah. Um, And, yeah, I love listening to Steve's voice. He's very soothing and calming. I hope he does some meditations. I'm I'm really glad that you chose him because he... You know, I, I just found him very surprising and charming and gentle and thoughtful. But I am really, really focused and looking forward to hearing your stories. Now, I know that you've put lots of thought and effort into your choices and you had lots of different options. Are you happy with the combination that you've landed with? Yeah, definitely. I tend to overthink things, <laughs> yes, and then get paralysed by not being able to make a decision. Um, but no, definitely now I've arrived at a place where I'm like, I love the five that I've chosen and I look forward to sharing some of the stories. Uh, wonderful. Okay, well, as traditional, we are starting with your film. And I'm really pleased, actually, because both your film and your book I hadn't actually heard of. So it's mm. part of the wonderful... Uh, byproduct of the, of the benefit of doing this show is, is I get to read and watch films and books that I wouldn't normally do. So you've chosen an amazing film by the wonderful Jennifer Siebel Newson, uh, Misrepresentation, came out in 2011. Tell us uh, about that film and, and why you've chosen it, Taryn. Yeah, I chose it because I've always loved documentaries, but this one being that it was directed by a woman, it had a, a slightly different flavour, I think, as a woman um, when I watched it. And I remember sitting in the theatre, I was invited to this um, screening event in Adelaide by a woman called Melinda tankard Reist. Um, she runs Collective Shout here in Australia. And I, I sat there and I was so moved and traumatised by and shocked by the statistics in the film um, and just the representation of media or lack thereof, um, in particular in the US. And I, it was the first time that I thought, I want to tell a story through film. What an impactful way to get across a message. And that's how Embrace actually started for me, was watching that film. Now, Embrace, for, for people who might not know, is, is your amazing film uh, based around your, your life's work now. Would, would you maybe explain to us uh, or some people who, who might not have heard of it? Yeah, so Embrace is, is my journey um, on how I learned to love my body, but more so going out into the world to discover why so many people hate their bodies and what we can do about it. And it was a crowdfunded film. Um, I used Kickstarter to get the seed funding for Embrace, um, set out to raise $200,000 and 
bless 8,909 people around the world that contributed and um, we hit the target on day 12 of the 60-day campaign and went on to raise 331000 So from the very get-go, Embrace the Documentary was special um, because it was never my film. It was a collective um, team effort of people and... Yeah, first time film director. Um, I've never done anything like that. I thought, Nigel, that being a photographer and enjoying telling stories equals film director. <laughs> so, and now I work at the Adelaide Studios. I'm surrounded by filmmakers, and I'm like, I'm sorry. I'm so sorry for being so nonchalant and being so like, I can make a film. Like, it's easy. Um, <laughs> like, they, they probably hated me for a while there. Um, but, yeah, look, Embrace has had uh, remarkable success around the world. And success for me looks like people watching it um, and and reconsidering how they feel about their, their body. And millions of people have now seen it. Netflix picked it up. It was seen in 190-odd countries and... What a what a magical project to work on, and it's really opened up for me um, just the the desire to tell stories through more films. I reckon I've got at least three or four rocking around in my head at the moment. So it, it, it's a, it's a wonderful film for anyone who who hasn't seen it. And there's something uh, at the risk of getting too um, too complimentary early on is when I look at some of the organisations that that I get involved with or ask for my help in a professional capacity, there are, I divide them into two. People who, for all good intentions, they like thinking about an issue, talking about an issue, writing about an issue. And there's another bunch of people who like actually doing something <laughs> about an issue. And I put you firmly in that box. You, you, you do amazing work. And, and I think that film, you know, is changing lives around the world. Could you talk about where you where you think we're at on the trajectory. So, so the ridiculous, like your film, Misrepresentation, which obviously is a play on words, misrepresentation, it is, is there any progress? Are my teenage daughters, Grace and Evie, going to grow up in a world where there are less idiotic uh, pressures on women or is it getting worse or staying the same? Um, I definitely think it's getting better, but we need to remember that when eight, eight odd years ago I put out a before and after photograph, um, gosh, I... I hate to talk about this photo, but I guess it's, I, I need to be really respectful. That's how it all began. But so for anyone who doesn't, um, who has not seen it, you know, normally we see a woman before and she, or a man, and they're overweight and then they lose weight and they're after photographed. They're miraculously happy. Um, and I called BS on that and I swapped mine around. So my before was on stage as a bodybuilder that I did for 15 weeks, okay? So when people call me a bodybuilder, I'm like, I did it for 15. It was a social <laughs> experiment, guys. <Yeah. laughs> I wasn't eating chicken and broccoli for the rest of my life just for 15 weeks. The, the before photograph was ripped on stage, bikini body. My after is as my body is now, some rolls, some sags, some cellulite stretch marks, etc. When I put that photograph out in the world, I received over 7,000 emails and messages from people sharing their most heartbreaking stories about how they felt about their bodies. So I suspect up until that time, um, we were holding on to a lot of shame about how we felt about our bodies and, and we weren't certainly not sharing it. Um, it was very much behind closed doors. So I think it was really a really great time to go out into the world and in eight years, without a doubt, um, the body positive movement has come alive. You know, everyone's talking about it. Everyone's talking about diversity, inclusivity, and we're seeing the the advertising campaigns um, change how they portray, you know, five women. It's not just five white, um, you know, size eight women anymore. We're seeing it more. So look, we've got a long way to go, um, but we're certainly on the right sort of trajectory, I believe. Because embracing feels good, right? And I think you you are a significant part of the reason why that progress has been made. I, I, I have to say that one of the most moving parts of that film is when you are interviewing, you know, just delightful, perfectly normal looking, happy people. I, I would say before you ask them the question that you ask in the film and you go, how would you describe your your body or how you look? And you expect them to say, oh, fine. Or they go, disgusting, revolting. And I, I just, I mean, it's a tragedy what we do to women's heads. 
absolutely yeah. ridiculous. I mean, it's our home. Yeah. Why are we talking about our home like that? You know, we get this one body for our life, um, and all of the time that is wasted on being awful to ourselves, in being in our own heads. And I guess the great tragedy is never really being truly present in our lives. Yeah. You know, if we're having sex with our partner, we're worried about where our boobs are or how our bum looks, or um, you know, we're on the dance floor and how are we jiggling like. It's a travesty to live our lives so anchored down like that. So I, I, I often get asked the question, in, in particular in the US, like, oh, a global movement of change. Do you feel the pressure, Taram? And I'm like, no, because what I'm selling, for a better word, you know, the philosophy of embrace, it's, it feels so good that when you've got it and when you live like that, people are like, hey, what's your secret sauce? And it's just yeah. like, <laughs> it's like, well, embracing the body and getting on with your life. Um, it's incredibly infectious, I think, um, this movement. So we've only just begun. I've got a lifetime's worth of work ahead. Um, and I'm very, feel very honoured to to do the work that I do. Well, listen, more power to you. Absolutely fabulous. For, for your second choice, we're staying with a, with, with a similar theme, but we're going to the, I think, the global south, they call it, or developing countries. Um, you've chosen a book, gosh, uh, what a powerful, moving read. 2009, Half the Sky by a husband and wife team, Nicholas Christoph and Cheryl Wu Dunn. Could you tell us about that book, what it's about, and, and why you chose it? Mm, this book had the most profound um, effect on me. So, the book, um, written by two journalists, and in the book they talk about th how they were, uh, they moved to China and they were watching troops in Tiananmen Square open fire with automatic weapons on um, pro-democracy protesters. And the massacre claimed between, I think it was 400 and 800 lives, and the world was transfixed um, on this human rights story. And the vision was was shocking. But shortly after that, during their time in China, they, they came across a study that outlined another human rights violation that claims tens of thousands of lives um, each year. This is really shocking. 39,000 baby girls die annually in mm. China because parents don't give them the same medical care and attention as they do boys. So the result, this is the why behind the book, which I always find really fascinating. What drives someone? What's, what is that impetus to then going out and traveling the world and writing this book? And this is where it all began. Um, so all these girls are dying unnecessarily every week in China. And as, as many girls are dying each week um, as they were in Tiananmen Square, but but no one's reporting on it. No no one's covering these stories. And in the book they write, those Chinese girls never received a column inch of news coverage and we began to wonder if, as journalists, our priorities were skewed. And then I think from there, and this happens, right, in life you kind of open up Pandora's box and all of a sudden you're down the rabbit's hole of what's going on in India and what's going on in Pakistan. And, and that's what that book is. It's, it's a book about turning oppression into opportunity, but sharing the most heartbreaking stories. Did you have a little tear? or did, I mean, how did oh, it impact? No, it, it, it was it just uh, heart-rending. And, and I, I, I hate to quote George Clooney, but he said, it's impossible to read this book and do nothing. Yeah. And you go, yeah, word up, George. That's uh, You think, blimey, what am I doing about this? Uh, yeah. And I think that's the really smart call to action in this book. At the, at the end of the book, there's, you know, here are 10 things that you can do in the next 10 minutes. Because I think we've talked about this before, Nigel. It's one thing when you get people rallied up and, you know, they're fired up and, yeah, we all want change. And then if they leave the auditorium that you've been on stage speaking in front of them and they're like, yes, but they do nothing. What a complete waste of their time and yours. Like we have to do. Um, and one of the things that that I do with this book is every year I buy, I think it started off as like 20 copies and, and now it's, I just have a stack on hand at home and I just, I give them out to people that I think need to hear and read the stories and then ask them to pass it on because the stories need to be heard. And I think at Western women and men, you know, we're, we're the lucky ones. You know, we're the ones with the voices. We're the ones with the power. We're the ones that need to do because they need our help. And, 
you know, we're not getting burned alive um, because our, our hymen wasn't intact on our wedding night, you know, marrying a guy who's 30 or 40 years older than us. Um, we're not being sold to sex traffickers to work in a brothel for 15 hours a day and seven days a week. So we need to do, and I think we also need to reflect um, on how dare we complain about our cellulite. Yeah, do you know what? It, it, it's very interesting how it, it put, I mean, you know, all problems are contextual, but it does slightly, you know, I mean, check your privilege. I hate to use that phrase, but you go, when you're thinking about all the stories in that book and you go, oh, I'm worried that my belly button's a bit, you know, not a, is asymmetrical or something. It's, it's just trivial rubbish. I, I, I need to change tack slightly. It is mm. that the, the Nicholas and Cheryl and Jennifer, who, who did the book and, and misrepresentation of the film, uh, amazing inspirational people. I, I, I'd like to ask you, what are the traits that you most admire or value in other people, in your friends? Mm. Um, integrity all day long. Um, I, I think I really value people that, um, take more action and do less talking. Yep. And I mean, of course, all the, you know, the honesty and all of those things, but uh, humility is big for me. Humility is huge. Um, I think a sense of responsibility in the world, uh, um, that, that I really admire that in people that, um, that see something that's not right and then go and do something about it. And it was actually how I was raised. My my dad and my mum, of course, but more probably more so my dad, you know, he, he always says to me, or always used to, I think he brings it up still occasionally now, <laughs> but he says, um, you know, we all come into the world the same, Taryn, and we all leave the same. People are just people. And I've had a lifetime of watching him. Oh, it makes me feel a bit emotional because <laughs> it's, such, it's such, it's beautiful, right? Mm. Um, to see him talk to anyone and ev- anyone about everything, no matter who they are. Like, you know, I've been in rooms, Nigel, with some of the work that I've done. And people don't want to have a bar of you until they hear like, oh, she's done this. Or, or, yeah, and I yeah. think that's um, one of the worst possible human traits is, is, is someone that just doesn't um, value everyone equally um, and enjoy their stories um, and see who they are, you know, rather than all the BS that gets in the way. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. I'm going to flip the question. What, what's the trait you most dislike in yourself? <laughs> oh, there's just a pick few. one. <laughs> there's a few. Here we go. Here we go. The, the paralysis kicks in now. <laughs> um, hang on, I'm the self love queen. I guess this, this shouldn't be. This should be really. Or hard. are you? Or are you perfect, Miss Brumby? Get out! Are you kidding me? I've got lots going on. I can be quite neurotic. Um, oh, I think it's probably my impatience. I'm, okay. I'm really impatient, and I. Yeah, as I get older, I have less tolerance as well. <laughs> so, as in for people, like when I want something done, I want it. I think that's the sense of urgency when you go, "Oh, I'm 42, but hang on a second. It only felt like last night I was at the club knocking back a tequila and pashing that bloke on the dance floor, <laughs> and and now you know, 40, I'm 42, and I look at the sun in the sky and go, "What a great day for washing, or you know, three kids and a mortgage <laughs> and all those things." So, yeah, I think impatience. You you showed me a screenshot from your phone, and unless oh. I've got it wrong, I think you've got sixty six thousand unanswered emails. Is that right? <laughs> I mean, that is hilariously. <laughs> yeah, sixty. I'm looking at my phone. Sixty six thousand three hundred and fifty one, and then one hundred and forty seven messages. I mean, but one of those oh. could be Ellen asking you onto the show. Oh, she's already done that. We danced. We've already done that dance. <laughs> you've been on Ellen. No. <laughs> one of um, probably one of my, well, I don't know whether it's my biggest regrets, but um, the producers rang me and uh, when I was in the US and we had a conversation and as you know, Ellen was just the perfect platform for me to get on sure. and share about Embrace and all the things that we do at the Body Image Movement. And um, I think the producers wanted me to hear that I was like a crazy, oh my God, fan. Mm-hmm. And I didn't... I'm not. I, I see it as a platform and I I think that's what they wanted from me on the phone and they didn't get it. Right. So I just didn't play the ah. game. I should have, th- th- you know what, that would have compromised my integrity sure. if I was like, yeah, 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 I want to get on Ellen and do all that. Mm. Oh, I have some regrets about it. 
Well, listen, anyway, but, but, one day. But dancing is the perfect link to uh, the third choice on Five mm. of My Life. Now, we have a, um, a Spotify Five of My Life playlist that has everybody's uh, songs on it. So it's, it's great for your yeah, commute. Um, and you've chosen a song that actually is already on the, uh, the playlist. Uh, it's ABBA's only number one uh, hit in the US. It's the wonderful 1976 Dancing Queen. Tell me your story behind that, Torrin. Well, th- I chose that song because... It's been like an anchor in in my life um, that you hear that song quite a bit, right, if you're at weddings or if you're out and about. Yeah. Um, and I remember when I was, it was my 17th birthday and I was in a gay nightclub with my best friend and I was on the dance floor and that song came on and the lyrics, you know, only 17, dancing queen. And I was just, I was, you know, screaming like, yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, and... Every time I hear that song, I'm taken back to that moment and I'm taken back to that moment. I've been taken back there in my 20s, you know, in my in my 30s, now in my 40s. And I just think it's I don't, there's something that's anchored me into that moment and that deep reflection of how fast life goes. Sure. Um, because it does feel like it does feel like yesterday. Um and I look, dancing for me uh, is a big part of who I am. Um, I wouldn't say I was discouraged, but I certainly wasn't encouraged as a child to dance. We were more of a sporty family, so mm-hmm. um, played lots of netball and did other things. Um, but I think that dancing has saved me maybe once, twice or three times um, from just you know, falling into the depths of despair for whatever reason. Um, I just think throw on a song, get in your lounge room, dance it out, shake it out, sweat it out. There's real power in dancing. We know that because we, you know, in every culture um, we dance um, sure. because it is so joyous. W- w- would you say that moment was your happiest? Uh, and, and if not, when when has been your happiest time in your life? Mm. No, I don't think that was my happiest time. Um, I don't. I don't think I could singly define one moment of happiness. Um, hmm, it's a good question, but no, I definitely, I definitely don't think I could, Nigel. Um, there's certainly moments throughout my life where I've thought. Yeah, this is pretty awesome. Um, t- t- tell me about your teenage years when you were going to gay clubs and dancing your backside off. Uh, I was a naughty teenager. I ran away when I was 15. Um, you, you ran away from home? Yeah, ended up in Melbourne. Um, my well, no, Why? I have to ask. I, I can't even remember. It was just probably a stupid <laughs> argument. Mum and Dad probably tried to make me wear brown sandals or something <laughs> to school. Like, that, 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 like, Are you saying you're high maintenance, Torrin? No, <laughs> hey, 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 I am definitely not high maintenance now, but I've got three kids now and I'm going to be punished, I think, for my high maintenance as a child. Um, yeah, so mum, I rang mum the next day after being on the Greyhound bus for nine hours or whatever it was, and she's like, where are you? And I'm like, I'm in Melbourne. <laughs> so, and, uh, uh, yeah, I ended up staying in Melbourne. Um, gosh, I had got tattoos by bikers and lived on Chapel Street and, Oh yeah, I was a bit naughty. Gosh, I hope my kids never hear this. But um, now this is fa- this is what five of my life is about. And so, w- w- what was happening to school when I you were in out. a different? You dropped out. Yeah, I was bullied in school um, right. because I changed schools uh, in year ten, and. Um, When we had our first casual day, I wore a sports girl T-shirt and everyone was wearing Mambo Mambo and and Lacoste and Mm -hmm. um, I was the odd one out and from that moment, and the boys liked me and the girls didn't. I think that's, I can be kind of quite truthful about that. Um, um, I got some attention from the boys and, yeah, I was crushed by the girls in high school. So I was like fuck you, I'm going to go get a job as a dishwasher. And um, (laughs) that's what I did in a cafe. I thought I was so clever and so smart uh, washing dishes and, you know, stashing my money under my mattress. But, yeah, um, one of the the best bosses I've ever had and she actually um, really set me up with some really strong work ethics um, that have carried me through, you know, carried me through life um, in various roles. So, yeah, I was a bit naughty, Nigel. <laughs> so, so tell me, do, do you, have you ever, there's some amazing short stories about this, have you ever re-met 
the uh, the girls that bullied you? Yeah, How I have. How did that play out? Well, I wrote about one of them in my first book and then I saw her at an event and she was mortified um, and she was very, very sorry. And, um, yeah, it was actually really nice to be able to say, to hear the sorry, but also to be in a place where I could be forgiving um, and and understand that when people lash out at other people and are mean and nasty, it, it's not about the person, it's about how they feel about themselves or the trauma that they, they've been through. Um, there's still one I've not um, I've not seen. I'm not sure. Yeah, I'd have to be. A re- I'd have to put my big beige knickers on that day to be like, okay, I accept your apology. <laughs> <laughs> or maybe she wouldn't apologise. She just carry on she, being mean. <laughs> perhaps, perhaps. But I think it builds you, right? I mean, I think that built a resilience in me um, that n- that now you know, no is never no. Um, you know, my life motto is polite persistence wears down resistance. Um, I drive into car parks that say full because I'll know that I'll get a park. Like it's always <laughs> about pushing through to the other side. Um, so could, I could you repeat that helped. motto? That was wonderful. Polite. Polite persistence wears down resistance. Great. Mm. Yeah. Good on you. Mm. I just love in hearing your stories. We're moving on to your fourth choice, and gosh, it's it's I, I I feel moved even thinking about it. So thank you for for sharing the story you're about to say. It's a park bench in Sydney in Belmont Park. Could you uh, uh a describe the bench and where it is, but also why you've chosen it and the story behind it, Taryn? Mm, um, so this particular park um, opposite Central Train Station in Sydney was where my brother passed away. And every time I go to Sydney, I, you know, for work and for meetings, I always make sure I take the time to go and sit on that bench. And it's a real, it's really odd to sit somewhere that someone that you love and desperately miss, that was the last place he took his breath, you know, like his final breath was taken on that bench. And uh, my brother and I were incredibly close as kids. We spent um, every weekend um, collecting lizards and we even got a brown snake in a jar once, which my mum almost killed us for, and (laughs) um, tadpoling and, you know, getting frogs and we just, yeah, we were so, so close and um, sadly... um, in his teenage years, he um, he was a bit wild too, but probably didn't know where to put the limits on, you know, his exploration of, say, drugs. Um, and he tried heroin and, um, you know, he, just like I do as well, and other members of my family, incredibly addictive personalities. And that was it for him. He he was a heroin addict for, oh gosh, six or seven years. And... Um, and yeah, he got off the train in Sydney. He was going for a job and we'd spoken to him only a few days before and it felt like for anyone who's listening, who, who who's experienced a relationship with an addict, you go through the ringer in terms of the hope and we're turning a corner and here we go. But this last time that Jason had said, I'm going for this job, it's in Sydney, we all felt felt that he was turning a corner. How old was he? 27. 27. Yeah. And we we suspect that he needed to take a hit just to get that confidence to 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 go to that job interview. And obviously it was it was a bad dose of heroin and um yeah, he died. And when I sit on that bench, sometimes I just sometimes I sit there and eat. Sometimes I just sort of stare blankly. Um, sometimes I cry. Sometimes I think like watching everyone walk past, like, I feel like saying, I feel like saying, telling the story, like, Mm. you know, um, you know, this is significant and this is what happened. And I don't know what, where that comes from, but, um, I think just watching everyone go about their lives and you're sitting there in such trauma, I guess that happens to human beings every single day of their lives, right? People are always going through something and we just don't know. Um, but, yeah, gosh, that bench. Um, so, and how, have you got any other brothers and sisters? Or was... I have a sister, yeah. So Jason was four years older than me and Justine's seven years older than me. 
And, and, and uh, were you all wild? You, I'm thinking of the poor old <laughs> my mum and dad. You go, God, I, I need to meet them and, and give them a hug. Like, no, and my, everyone <laughs> loves my mum and dad. They're such beautiful people. And my sister, total square bear. Oh <laughs> total square bear. Um, and still is to this day. So, yeah. I mean, do you know what, though? I mean, I was, I was a little bit wild f- for a little while there, but I was also, I did sort of toe the line and, and do the right thing. Um, Jason was, you know, that's another level, really. Were, were you a druggie? No, 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 no. I mean, I, I tried different, you know, you experiment, um, but certainly not. No. Yeah. And, and do you think looking back, you know, I, I, I was talking to you about the, 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 the out of the forest guy that we spoke to on a different episode where, where people are amazing how things can happen and life takes you in different ways. Is, is, do you think anything could have been done differently that may have resulted in a different outcome on that bench or was it just destined that Jason was on a trajectory? Hmm. Yeah, I mean, this thought goes through your head, you know, a thousand times. What could have we, what more could we have done? I certainly know that my mum and dad couldn't have done any more. No. I mean, they found Jason on the streets in Melbourne when he was living there. He went missing for a few days and he was homeless. He was living on the streets. You know, they they drove their car around endlessly to try and find him. And when they did find him, you know, he he was homeless. He was mm. dirty. He smelt. His hair was gross, you know. And... As I've mentioned, you know, mum and dad are really good people with really solid values and, yeah, what, I mean, how that would have broken their hearts, I think, um, you know, that breaks my heart when I think of mum and dad and how they've coped with all this and then getting that knock on the door, you Mm. know, from, I I was in New Zealand at the time when I learnt of my brother's passing and even though you know there's risk, obviously, with, uh, you know, having a sibling with a, with a drug abuse uh, it problem, you never actually expect that you're going to hear those words. And my sister rang up and said, Jason's dead. And I just, you know, I dropped to my knees. I was at work, unfortunately. So, yeah, it was really tough. The, <laughs> to keep it lighter, though, I'll, I'll tell you a little story about um, when Jason's belongings came home um, to us as a family. He had a backpack and mum, dad, Justine and I sat around in the lounge room and went through his belongings and, um, you know, there was a book and there was a little packet of red frogs. Um, so now whenever my kids see red frogs, they go, mum, mum, there's red frogs. And we always buy them and eat oh, them and remember right. Jason. And um, But um, in the backpack, um, there was also um, dad, there was a piece of paper and dad started reading out names on this piece of paper and it was women's names. And about four names in, the penny dropped for me. I'm like, oh my God, dad's reading out Jason's sex list. (laughs) He's, he's, you know, he's sat on a train somewhere and gone, (laughs) who are all the women I've slept (laughs) with in my life? And let me tell you, the list was long. (laughs) But the, but the crack, I mean, if you met Jason, you would love him. The most charismatic, funny, delightful, warm, beautiful person you would ever meet. People love Jason. Sean Penn's stunt double, is that that right? Yeah. And, and, And again, this is classic Jason, always at the right place at the right time in terms if you know yeah. he was mine doing some mining job um, up in Mount Isa, and they were filming the Thin Red Line, and next minute they needed someone to yeah play Sean Penn's movie double, right? And he's <laughs> you know he's on the set of the Thin Red Line, you know, with all John Travolta and except A- adding I mean, names to his list. Yeah, well, <laughs> correct, Nigel. That's exactly right. Living the movie life. But when Dad kept reading the list, the funniest thing was, and the most awkward moment was. On the list, it had psychologist. Right. But then it had psychologist's daughter. I was like, <sighs> oh, my God. Did, did it have like... psychologist's mum as well? Did he have the <laughs> trifecta? <laughs> <laughs> and I think that sort of sums up my brother. That's kind of, that's a legendary move, that one, to not only have sex with a psychologist, but the daughter as well. <laughs> oh. oh, I love it. Well, we're coming to your fifth and final choice. Uh, my, my, traditionally my favourite of the five choices on five of my life. Uh, and you've chosen uh, Chico, is that how you pronounce it? Or Chico? Yeah, Chico, no, Chico. The Schnauzer. Now, for people who aren't dog people, uh, Schnauzers, they're the ones with the like impressive eyebrows and whiskers aren't they could just describe Chico yeah. and why you have chosen him on five of my life yeah he has got impressive whiskers and a beard and you know how they say the owners look like their dogs or the dogs look like their owners <laughs> <laughs> I don't think you look like a schnauzer <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's kind of you but um yeah look gosh 
bless that dog. He's three years old now. And um, I actually uh, bought him for a, a present for my um, for my ex-husband. Right. Nigel, that's the first time I've used the word ex-husband ever ah, okay. um, in an interview. Mm-hmm. Um, and... Uh, yeah, I mean, I believe strongly in divine synchronicity um, and the way that Chico sort of arrived in our family was just that um, we were looking for a schnauzer, we couldn't get one, We I went through every breeder to get one and um, I just randomly on this Saturday, I was lying in bed and it was raining outside and I thought, I'll just give one more a go, one more breeder and um, sure enough, they said, we've just had someone pull out of this puppy and he needs a home. And that was Saturday. Um, Chico arrived in Adelaide via the airport on a plane on Monday and, um, yeah, surprised uh, Matt and the kids with this little puppy. And, oh, gosh, gosh, I love that dog because he teaches me lots of lessons. Um, My life is pretty crazy. Um, Three kids, work full time. Um, Yeah, there's a lot on. 66,000 emails. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> That's right, exactly. Um, and Chico allows me just to escape from all of that. I'm never more present than I am when I'm with him. So, right. you know, when I go into nature and I'm just walking him and I'm watching him being joyous and running around and I just feel very, very grounded. Um, and, you know, he's. I had this moment, I, I was only about six six months ago, I reckon, I was thinking about love and When you have um, a child and you just, your own child, you go, I would die for you. I I never knew this kind of love was even possible. This is extraordinary. When you have your second child, when I was pregnant with my second, I'm like, oh, my God, I love the second child like I do the first. Um, And, of course, you do. And then I had a third child. I had the same thoughts. The same thing happened with Chico because we had a schnauzer that passed, um, and uh, and I wondered when I got Chico whether I would love him the same like I did the first schnauzer. And, of course, you do. And I, I, there was this really sort of lovely walk that I went on with Chico when I was having this kind of moment of reflection that um, there's no limit on love. You know, sure. love, it, and it's it's a beautiful thing. Um, to I love to love hard. You know, I love my friends hard. I love my family hard. I love Chico hard. I love my life hard. Um, and yeah, so Chico just, ha- I have these real hmm, lovely insights when I'm with him. Yeah. yeah. No, no, so talking about loving, loving hard and uh, living your life sort of at full pace, like I know you do, you also live it on social media which for me is a completely different thing. I mean, I've got like seven followers on Twitter or something. I don't think it's it's my kids and my dog, Matty. Um, And and you've got, you've got like 500 million and, and you're, you're, which is great because you're taking your message out to the world and it's part of your platform and it's part of you. And you're a very appealing, credible, convincing personality and force out in the world. But do, do you ever think, God, I wish I, (laughs) I wish I wasn't having to do whatever it is, you know, an Instagram post this week or a Twitter thingy, you know, your very, very, uh, your, your, your digital footprint, I think they call it is, is, is enormous and very frequent. Is that all, all fun or are there downsides on having to bloody well? No, of course there's downsides, um, to it as well. I mean, the community is what's really important to, to build a community based around this mission to, create global change when it comes to body image. So I think we can never underestimate um, the sharing within that community uh, is really important part of the puzzle of where we want to go. Yes, um, I only just had a conversation with a friend uh, a few days ago when we were walking where I was coming to the point where I wanted just to get back behind the camera. I'm making another documentary. I want to do a little less sharing um, and sort of, yeah, divert my attention elsewhere. Um, But there's risk in that as well. You know, if you spend seven or eight years building a community and then you just sort of dip out and, you know, bow out for a little while, what what happens? Um, So, yes, I wrestle with it a little bit. I think also you need to remember... I actually post when I feel like posting. Right. So I, I'm not a, I hate rules. I break, I just hate, I loathe rules. So, you know, I've had people say to me, you should post three times a day at these times. I'm like, no, I'm going to post when I feel like posting. So it's never too much of a chore. Um, 
Yeah. And I and I try and just share stuff that helps people. You know, I'm a conduit to a lot of people's pain and a lot of inspiration, not the stories that I'm sharing about me, but other people that I meet. So, and I love helping people. It's why I do what I do. It's what gets me out of bed in the morning. Um, so I'm not one of these social media people that goes, hey, look at this pen I'm using today, guys. And you can use my affiliate code. Like, <laughs> I, like there's no way, there's no, I couldn't do that stuff. You know, that's not for me. I, I, storytelling I saw, is. Yeah. I, I saw something uh, recently, uh, you, it's a thing like you can't do what you can't see. Which is mm. an interesting thought about you need to put proper images out in the world because then people realise. But but I see some of the stuff that you post, which I really like because it's you. Uh, I don't know after a run, and you look like a person who's been for a run. I mean, you don't look like heaven forbid. <laughs> heaven go, forbid. Th- that's just like a really important thing that you do because other people post a picture saying they've just been for a run and they haven't they've got their full makeup on in their hair they've been no or or people are sort of um posing in swimwear that hasn't seen water ever and never will so i i, I love your representations of you know a a, a happy fulfilled balanced real life yeah, yeah. i mean i think you know there's a great quote by steve fertig um that we compare our behind the scenes with everyone else's highlight reel yeah and so it's really important to me just to show it you know warts and all the good stuff the bad stuff and i think also you know i, I just sort of the penny dropped in my head just then when i was speaking what everyone doesn't see when i do a post is the hundreds and the thousands of personal messages that I get from people who who say, oh my gosh, this post is, you know, it's changed my perception on X. And, and then, you know, it, that, that perhaps in itself is a little bit of my addiction is, yes, you know, my addiction you get, yeah. to, no, no, not the affirmation to make me feel better, but the affirmation that I'm helping You're someone. Help, yeah, no, no, like that feels so good. Sure. That fills up my cup. So that is a bit of a drug for me. Um, and I was only speaking to a friend of mine, Tammy Ruse, a couple of years ago in Fiji, we were at a, an event, we were both speakers and um, I was saying to her, Tammy, we've impacted millions, but there's billions of people on the planet. And I was all freaked out about it. And she's like, she put her hand on my shoulder and I've never felt like such an idiot, but I, I love this woman. She's so powerful. She goes, Taryn, it's not your job. <laughs> and I was like, she's like, you're speaking from ego. And then I was like, I don't have an ego. I don't, you know, and then she's like, no, no, you are. You just need to. And she's actually really helped me to calm the F down a little in terms of meditation um, and really getting grounded. And I think that's where I'm headed now in terms of social media and what I do and where I put my energy and time. It's how do I get, you know, the biggest bang for, for, for my buck to get this message out there. Um, and I'm a bit of a yes person and a bit of a people pleaser. So, um, but then it leaves me with 65,000 emails. Yeah, yeah, you know? yeah. Oh, it's, it's just wonderful talking to you. And I, I can't thank you enough for sharing on Five My Life. I've got two final questions for you. Mm. One traditional and one I've just pulled out of my backside. Uh, what is your greatest fear? Mm. Um... Gosh, there's not a lot I fear, Nigel. Um, what a great space to be in. Mm, it is. Yeah, that's a really tough question for me. I mean, okay, maybe this is what it is. It's inevitable that we're going to die, but I'm not ready to go anywhere for a really long time. And I, my hope is, which means there's fear wrapped up in it because there's fear and the hope of, I hope that when it's time to go, I'm at peace with that. And I fear not being at peace with going. Because if I feel like I feel now, I'm like, "Mm mm-mm, so much more to do. Um, It's been such a wonderful life. I've had a lot of stuff happen in my life that's been incredibly tragic. Um, But, gosh, it's a beautiful life. And, um, yeah, maybe I fear letting go of that. What a a great answer. Thank you. I get the, the traditional Last question, the which is no longer a surprise, is uh, who would you like to hear on Five of My Life next? Yeah, I thought about this. Um, Madonna? Sure. Well, uh, tell, tell us why you want to hear from Madonna. 
<laughs> because then you'll know her and then I can come to the studio and meet her, which is on my bucket list. <laughs> <laughs> I think she's an extraordinary person. I mean, I, you know what? I want to throw that challenge out to you. Get yeah, her on the podcast, right. no, Nigel. Challenge accepted. Challenge um, accepted. And then producers who are listening, just know that on that day I'll be someone's assistant. <laughs> I'll be super, I'll be so cool about it. No, I won't be. <laughs> no, she's probably been the most influential person in my life. So, oh. um, yeah. Why? Why? Why has Madonna had such an effect on you? Um, because when I was a young teenager, um, I just saw her pushing the boundaries and a relentless determination, um, getting up after she's fallen, um, saying and doing things that most people wouldn't without fear. Um, I, I just think she's a real true uh, warrior. And the way that she has then gone on to reinvent her life over and over and over and over again and break down those stereotypes, um, I think that takes extraordinary um, strength um, and will. And uh, yeah, uh, I dedicated my, I've dedicated two books to her, the film to her, and yeah, she's on my bucket list. So I'd love to sit down with her one day and have a yarn. Well, so when we get her on, we're going we're gonna to send you an invite. Of course you are. <laughs> Tarrant, Tarrant, th- thank you so much for, for coming on. That, that's just been such a delightful chat and I, I really appreciate you taking the, the format seriously and giving your time. You are a busy person. Clear some of those emails, please, for the love of God, clear some of your emails. And <laughs> <laughs> thank you for coming on Five of My Life. Oh, thank you for having me. It's been a real pleasure. The Five of My Life was presented by me, Nigel Marsh. Producer, Alex Mitchell. Sound production and theme music by Darcy Thompson and Matt Nicholish. 